Hey, this is Eric. This is Advanced GIS Class 3, in which I'm going to be talking about Cardo CSS using the map platform Cardo DB. This lesson assumes that you're familiar with Cardo DB and editing maps using the visualization wizard. If you're not, please do that first. This also assumes that you have some earthquake data. We talked about it in class two, so you might still have it in your account, but if you don't, it's available right here at this URL. I can paste a link to it in the description for the video. So all I've done is download that data, create a table, and rename that table to just earthquakes. Let me show you that before we go too much further. So the table that it creates is going to have a longer name. I renamed it to just earthquakes. Then I created a visualization. I just called it lesson three earthquakes. <clears throat> Don't worry too much about what it's named or anything like that. Um, okay. And as we talked about in last class, you can use the visualization wizard here to style your points really quickly and easily, and you can change colors relatively easily. Um, what if you wanted to change the color of the markers to something that's not already there? You have all of these choices, but what if you want a different color? One thing you could do is use a tool such as Cooler, which is linked to here, that will help you to pick a color in RGB. And then you can copy and paste this over, this hex value, into this box. And your points should be updated with that color. What if you wanted to use a tool like this, which uses a different color system than RGB? This uses HSL. So I pick this color. I think this will look really good for the earthquakes. And I copy this, and it's just not going to work in this box. This box only works on RGB hex. Nothing happens. So um, this is one case where you might want to change the code behind the visualization. And that is available here in this button that says CSS. It's the Cardo CSS button. You, when you click on it, you see some code. Right now it's only 13 lines of code. And you see that it's talking about earthquakes. That's the name of the table. And then in these curly braces, it has a bunch of properties that it's setting. We're going to talk more about the syntax of this, but hopefully that much is clear so far. And the property that I want to change to change the color of those markers is marker fill right here. You can see that it is set to the hex value that we set earlier. So I'm going to select it and paste in my HSL. Nothing changes yet until you click apply style or hit control S. So now we have my color, and I'm a bit happier now. So that's a very, very basic introduction to what Cardo CSS is. Now let's, let's talk about a little bit of the background. Cardo CSS is a open source language created by Mapbox for styling maps. It's used in their product, TileMill and it's used for their platform to create their tiles. It's also used by the OpenStreetMap project. OpenStreetMap has done a lot of work to convert its map tile um, language to Cardo CSS. And as we've already talked about, it's used by CardoDB. 
One reason why Cardo CSS has become popular amongst others in the GeoWeb, including OpenStreetMap and other open source projects, is that it converts the language that you write in, Cardo CSS, into something that MapNIC understands. And MapNIC is the tile renderer that many open source GeoWeb projects use, including OpenStreetMap, Mapbox, and TileMill. <coughs> So why would you want something like Cardo CSS? One of the reasons is that styling maps can just be painful. If you're if you're writing the code to style maps with Mapnik, it looks something like this. And it's really long. It'll be thousands of lines like this. And it's just not very expressive, and it's a lot of redundant lines. <clears throat> also, this is a screenshot from QGIS. Um, the problem with QGIS for some people is that it's a lot of clicking, and a lot of the options are kind of buried w within dialogues. Another great reason to use Cardo CSS is that you can share it. It's just text. You can just copy and paste it, put it online, send it to somebody, ask for help debugging something, or just share it as an open source thing. So for instance, this is a blog post that I wrote using some, uh, I was showing off some maps that I made in CardoDB and I shared the code there too, because I could. There's also, as I mentioned, OpenStreetMap uses Cardo CSS for its map tiles now. You can you can find this on GitHub and actually dig through the code from there. And here's a snippet of what it looks like. It's maybe not super readable to you right now, but it, I promise it's much more readable than that XML we were just looking at. So Cardo CSS. You might think of it as a dashboard, as a place where you're turning knobs and adjusting site settings for this big machine. Uh, I think it's more like, like a jet dashboard. Um, and over here we have some settings for markers, over here for polygons, lines, who knows what. Um, so we were looking at essentially this. I think this is a bit different from what we were looking at, but this is the basic structure of a statement in Cardo CSS. I would call this whole bit of text a statement. Statements always start with a selector. You have to tell Cardo CSS what you're talking about. In this case, we're talking about the table called earthquakes. Remember, I renamed my table to earthquakes. Otherwise, you have to write out the whole table name, which can be quite long, depending. And this always starts with a pound sign. And as I said, this translates to this statement's going to talk about the table called earthquakes. Always put a left curly brace after the selector. This officially starts your statement. And always, always, always remember to close it with the right curly brace. OK? Think of those curly braces as the bookends. And if you don't have both bookends, your properties are going to fall all over the place. And CardoDB, Mapbox, other projects aren't going to understand what you're talking about. Between those bookends, set your properties. And a property is defined in the documentation for Cardo CSS. We've already seen a few properties. But as I said, there are properties that work just for markers. It's one section of the dashboard. You can skip right to it, and you can see 
um, these are all the names of properties. Okay, so the name of this property is marker fill, and the value I'm setting it to is this color string. Always make your properties one per line, always end them with a semicolon, like that. And in addition, you always want to separate the property name and the value by a colon. So remember, marker line color is the name of the property, and this color string is the value that you want to set that property to. So in this case, I'm setting marker line color to have the color represented by FFF. the values that you're setting properties to are going to mostly be color strings, numbers, or true false values. You can see this in the documentation. So if I look at marker fill, where's marker fill? Here's marker fill. Okay, let me make it a little bit bigger. Marker fill takes a color. And if you click on color here, it's going to tell you in, de in detail what those marker, those color values can be. So as we saw, it can be a hex RGB value. It can be an HSL, as I pasted in earlier. Sometimes you can actually just you type out the name of the color. So if it's a really common color like green, purple, white, you can just type that in. And as I've already been showing you, use the documentation. It's going to tell you exactly what the value should look like. Okay, so now that you know what markers look like and roughly how they're styled, what I'd like you to do is using the documentation and CardoDB, but not using the visualization wizard, make some markers and make those markers five pixels wide, outlined by a two pixel wide line, and then give the inside and outside two different colors. I, it doesn't matter to me what those colors are. Uh, just pick some nice colors. And why don't you pause the video and come back when you're set with that. Okay, how'd that go? I did this also while you were working on this. So, let's go through them one by one. Make markers that are five pixels wide. You do this by setting marker width to 5. The number here is always interpreted as pixels, so you don't have to tell it. It just knows that they're pixels. And if you had a hard time finding that, remember that you can always look through the markers section of the documentation. And here I found marker width. Okay outlined by a two pixel wide line. That's going to be marker line width. It's the width of the stroke around a marker shape. And you can see here that I set marker line width to two. Give the inside and outside of the markers different colors. So marker fill is the inside. I set this using HSL and marker line color is the color of the line around the marker. I just set that to orange, as you can see. Again? Hopefully that makes sense so far. So, as I said, that's kind of nice, but you can do pretty much all of that using visualization wizards. Where Cardo CSS gets more powerful is in more interesting things than that. 
one really common use case is I want my markers to be larger when you zoom in. The way Carter CSS works the way, and the way that we have it defined right now, those markers that I have are always going to be five pixels wide, even when I zoom in. They, it's kind of um, frustrating as a user, I think, to zoom in and see the, the points kind of keep getting smaller or further away as you zoom in. Or at least it feels like they're getting smaller, even though they're staying the same size. So the way you do that is through this kind of statement. So this is a sub statement within earthquakes, right? So I have this larger earthquakes statement and I have my default properties represented by marker width and then the ellipsis here. You don't actually type the ellipsis, it's just an omission of other properties. So <clears throat> what this condition says is, yeah, do all of those things above me, but if the zoom, which is the map zoom, is greater than or equal to 10, then actually change the marker width to 8. Take a second and type this out into your rules, and I'll show you how that works. So as I said earlier, uh, it's a substatement, so it goes within the earthquakes statement. I like to keep everything lined up, so I'll remove some of the spaces here. Okay, better. So, as I said before, all of these other things apply to all of the markers in the earthquakes table, but then when zoom is greater than or equal to 10, these rules in here are going to apply. I'm actually going to make it even bigger. I'm going to make it 15, so it's harder to miss when we do it. Um, yeah, so I'm going to save and over here you can see the zoom level. You can see that we're currently at 4. And I'm going to zoom in 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. So you can see that the, the circles got much larger, and you can see the green much better. If we zoom back out to 9, you want to see them get smaller. Back to 10, they get bigger. And this base map that I'm using only goes to 10. That's the highest zoom level. So we I, I can't zoom in it anymore, but it would apply to even higher zoom levels if they were available. So let's go back to our Cardo CSS. That's great. Um, you could do as many properties in here as you wanted. So if you also wanted to change colors, you could do that here. I think it's kind of weird to change the colors as you zoom in, depending. So I'm not going to do anything like that, but it's definitely, definitely a possibility. As I said, we're going to call those conditional statements. And translating this statement into plain English, it's saying, make the earthquake markers three pixels wide. If the map is at zoom level 10 or higher, make the earthquake markers eight pixels wide. Okay? Here's another thing you can do. So you can combine conditions by putting them right after one after the other before you start with your properties. So in square brackets, I have the old condition that we already had, and I made another condition with zoom less than 16. So this, this gives you a way of making an even more specific rule. 
why don't we do that over here? So since I can only go to 10 on this base map, I'm going to change this greater than or equal to to 8. And I'm going to save, and you, just so you can see that the markers are still much wider than they would be at 7. See how much smaller they get? OK. And I'm going to add zoom less than or equal to 9. OK. Remember, that's just in square brackets, zoom, and then some expression, where those expressions can be equal, not equal, less than, greater than, less than or equal to, greater than or equal to, right? So now this is going to work where the zoom is greater than or equal to 8, and it has to be less than or equal to 9. So if I zoom into 9, they're still big, but when I zoom into 10, they should get much smaller. And if I remove this other condition, the less than or equal to 9, they'll get big again. Because this is true. Zoom is greater than or equal to 8. But if I add my condition back in, they get smaller. OK? So this is the statement translated into plain English again. I think I already said this. But if you need it to be reiterated, this is what it's saying. Mm, so that's one thing you can do with conditional statements with zoom levels, but more likely you'll have a series of substatements like this, and you can put as many of these as you want into your statement. So more often than restricting the zoom like this, you'll actually, and I'm going to copy and paste this because I'm lazy, say if the zoom's greater than or equal to, to 5, or let's say 6, make the marker width 15. If we're up to 8, make it even bigger, make it 20. Okay, So now they should get much bigger. And as I zoom out to 9, that's still true, it's still 20. At 8, it's still 20. But now as I zoom into 7, we'll see that it goes down to 15. And if I zoom back to 5, they'll be back to their 5 width. OK? When you're writing Cardo CSS, it's important to remember that order matters. So the last, the furthest down in our code here, is the one that wins. So if I switch these, so that it says, if the zoom is greater than or equal to 8, change this property. But then right afterwards, if the zoom is greater than or equal to 6, change the property. This one's going to overwrite the 8. So greater than or equal to 6, 7, 8, they don't get any bigger. But if I switch the order again, they will. So let's make sure that you understood that. Take a break, pause this, and try to make your markers double in width every three zoom levels. OK, how'd it go? Let's look at it together. So I'm starting my marker width at 5. And then when the zoom is greater than or equal to 3, 
I up it to 10. When it's greater than or equal to 6, I double that. And when it's greater than or equal to 9, I double that. I hope that makes sense. So that's not all. Modifying the way your map looks by zoom level is super handy and is not usually built into the visualization wizards. And I would encourage you to use it for just about any map that you're making. But Cardo CSS can do way more than that. You can also change the styles of your markers and other features based on those features attributes. So in this case, I have a mag field that is a number. And I'm saying if the earthquake's magnitude is greater than or equal to 6.5, make the marker width larger. Why don't we do that together? So I'm going to go over here. And I'm going to reuse my condition from earlier. And I'm going to say mag greater than or equal to, what was it, 6.5. And when I save, we should see some of them get bigger. Some of them stay the same size. When you're doing this kind of thing and it's not clear to you that something changed, don't be afraid to just make it a ridiculous number that you wouldn't use. So now it should be really clear that, that our condition is working, okay? All right. Hopefully that looks familiar. It's a whole lot like changing based on the zoom level, like doing conditional statements based on the zoom level. When you're talking about a string, you have to wrap that string in quotes. So let's look at a concrete example of that. There's also a place field on our earthquakes table. Why don't we go over here and find it together so that you can see it? You see that there's a place field and it's a string. Okay. I just picked one of those place strings at random, Northern Mid-Atlantic Ridge. Okay. And I said, if the place is equal to that, so if the earthquake happened at that place, change the marker width. So let's go back to the map view and open up the Cardo CSS. And instead of doing mag greater than or equal to 6.5, I'm saying place equals the place name. So if you did this without the quotes, and try to apply the style, you see that CardoDB says down here, invalid code, place equals northern mid-Atlantic ridge. The reason it does this is computer the computer doesn't understand what this northern mid-Atlantic ridge is. It's expecting it to be a like a, an attribute on the feature. See, attributes, you don't have to do anything special with it. It understands those, and it's kind of expecting the same thing over here. So what you want to do is you want to make it clear that, no, this is something you don't know about, computer. So so just just take my word for it. So I put it in quotes. It's um, compare actually these characters rather than comparing it to an attribute on the feature. So I'm going to save this. We see that most of them get small, but some of them along this ridge did get bigger. I'll make them even bigger just for fun. Okay. And so while we're here, why not try it yourself, pause the video, um, try to make your markers bigger or have them be a different color or something else. Just change a property or two when the magnitude is over seven. I'll give you a few seconds to do that. Okay, how'd that go? 
I did this. So in square brackets, you have mag greater than 7, because I asked for magnitude over 7. And I changed three properties just to show you what that could look like. So I made the marker width larger. I made the line width 0, so that it has no outline. And then I went back to our pink color. OK? So what if I, OK, so you can combine conditions in other ways. You don't have to put them right next to each other and make the conditions more restrictive. You can actually repeat, repeat changes to properties using a comma. So this might look like this. So um, I have this statement, this substatement, with two conditions. One is mag greater than greater than 5.5, and place northern mid-Atlantic ridge. But you see that they have a comma between them. So what this is saying is match any earthquakes that have either this or this or both, and then change the properties. OK, so I'm going to copy this over just to make it more clear. Pasting it right here. So mine's slightly different. It's mag greater than 7, because that's what we were just using. Or the place is northern mid-Atlantic Ridge. So remember, these are the, the mag greater than 7s. And I'm going to hit Apply Style now. And we should see also some of the northern mid-Atlantic Ridge earthquakes lit up, right? So if I cut that out and apply, they go away. If I put it back in and apply, they come back. What if I removed this comma? As we saw earlier, when we put them next to each other, I'm saying I only want earthquakes that are both magnitude greater than 7 and they must be in this place. I'll hit save. It doesn't apply to any because there are no magnitude 7 earthquakes in this place. So using the comma is really just a shortcut. Um, it's lazy, but it's lazy in a good way because you're not repeating yourself and you won't have to change multiple lines of code to change it for just for change things that should act the same way. So going back to my example, if I um, th this is exactly equivalent to mag greater than seven and place sorry like this remove the comma so it's the same exact thing as doing as setting all of these properties in two separate statements. But it's much nicer to look at to have a comma here. <clears throat> and then if you wanted to change those lines, going back to this way, you'd have to change this one and this one if you wanted them both to be bigger. So if you definitely want them to go together, just use the comma. It'll save you a lot of time. OK, this is just summarizing what, what I just talked through. Um, so remember, if you combine conditions without the comma, you set properties with you're setting properties for features that do have both conditions as i just said and it's more restrictive
it's more restrictive than putting the comma in. The comma says either either or both would be fine, but doing it without a comma, putting them right next to each other, says both have to be true, otherwise the properties will not get set. Okay, to recap, conditional statements go in square brackets like this. They're a property name, some kind of comparison, and then a value for that for that attribute. You can restrict statements by putting conditions right next to each other, like this. You can be more inclusive by separating conditions with a comma, like this. So either of those two conditions would make the properties within the curly braces take hold. And you can use as many of these as you need to, as we kind of already saw when we were looking at the zoom level stuff. You could do it like that. And one last thing within this little section, you can split those up if you want to, if it looks better, or sometimes there are good reasons to, you can split these up. So in this case, um, I could bring this substatement out, like that. And it's not going to have any effect like this. If you save, it, it doesn't know that you're talking about the earthquakes table, so it does not find any features to style this way. If you want to use these, you have to put pound sign and then your table name right here. And you have to do that for both of them. So it makes you type a lot more, but it will work. So it's just important to remember that they're, they're equivalent. I much prefer to put it inside. Sorry, I'm undoing. I much prefer it like this, and, and you should too. But sometimes there will be good reasons to separate it out more. OK. We are looking at doubling the the widths of markers every couple of zoom levels earlier, remember? I'm so like this is another feature of Cardo CSS that can be really handy is when you have statements like these, I'm going to copy them over and um sorry, and get rid of this. So the greater than or equal to 12 isn't really going to apply here. I'm actually going to make these every three like last time. Three, six, and nine. Okay, so we're at zoom level two, just to make sure that it's taking hold. They should get bigger. Okay, at six they should get even bigger. Perfect. Okay. So this is totally fine. Um, and it does the job most of the time. But as we can see, um, we're just incrementing by five every time. And it would be kind of a pain if I always wanted it to be spaced out this way. So let's say, um, I like the way that it's getting bigger by zoom, but I want the first one to be seven, the first, the default width to be seven. So if I come back out here, the transitions are going to be different now, and that might be okay, but what if you actually wanted it to go up by seven every time now? then you'd have to change each one of these. Okay.
And then, so CardiDB is taking a couple of seconds to load. I'm going to give it time. It can get really painful if you are constantly making changes like these. So maybe I made these changes and then I said, no, actually 5 was better, so I'm going to change the, that one to 5, that one to 10, this one to 15, and change it back to the way it was. Okay, I'm going to refresh this just to make sure something was hanging up. Okay, back to Cardo CSS. Um, so, right. So there's a lot of potential back and forth, and I'm just showing you this because, not because you're necessarily going to run into this, but because it is a good way of thinking about a really handy feature of Cardo CSS that I think you will find useful. So as I said, what if we wanted to change that marker width? There's a better way than changing each one individually. What you can do is use a variable. And a variable looks kind of like this. It starts with an at sign, and then you give it a name, any name. Um, it There are some restrictions, but basically you can't put spaces in the name. Um, you can't start it with a number. In this case, I'm going with a very simple width. I'm just going to copy and paste this over. Width, colon, and then the value that I'm setting the width to, right? Uh, Cardo DB, refreshing. Okay, it looks like it's back. Okay, so putting that at the top here, width is six. That's not going to change anything until I go here to marker width. And now instead of saying, well, I guess it should be five. Instead of saying marker width is five, I'm going to change this to say marker width is whatever value is in width. Okay? So that should be exactly what it was before. Nothing should have changed. Looks, looks exactly the same to me. So what's nice about this, though, is that you can use expressions on variables. So in this case, asterisk to multiply some other value with that variable. So if we go back to our example, we don't really want marker width always to be 10 for zoom greater than or equal to 3. We want it to be double the width, the default width. So at width times 2. Okay, so now when we get to 3, it should be up to 10, just like normal. And I'm going to copy this and paste it here, but up it to 3. So we always just want the width to be 3 times whatever the default width is. And in this case, 4, for zoom greater than or equal to 9. Okay. So I'm refreshing, and everything should work exactly the same way. But what's great about this is now I can change the width for all zoom levels at once. So I'm doubling it here. Um, at zoom greater than or equal to 6, which is where we are, it's going to replace at width with 10 here. So they should be 30 wide when I save, and they are much bigger now, right? So that's roughly how, that's how variables work. You define them towards the top at the variable name, colon, the value, then end it with a semicolon. And then you can just use at and your variable name wherever you find it useful. And it doesn't have to be um, that you always use it for width. You could do it, you could use it in weird places um, like, I don't know, in your color definition, you could say width. And then we get a totally different color. 
and then when width changes, we'll get a different color. Okay? I'm going to undo that though. That's kind of a weird thing to do, but you could do that. Speaking of colors, you can make variables for colors also, right? So the way you would do this is um, exactly the same way as with numbers, but you, for the value, you put a color string. And this can be any type of valid color string. And then you can use that color further down in your statements. When this could be really handy is when you have multiple tables and you want to make the colors the same in some cases, then you can just create a variable, use it in your statements, and then when you decide to change the color later, it's automatically going to update for all of the, all of the colors that you set that to. Okay, I'm going to pause again here. Uh, we're quite nearly done now, but I want to make sure that this makes sense to you. So why don't you use a variable for one of your properties in your visualization? Try it out. Okay, I hope that was successful for you. Finally, I just want to make it clear that you don't have to memorize all of this. I know this was long and technical and had a lot of details in it. For one, you can use the documentation. I'm going to link to the documentation for Cardo CSS later in the description. Experiment with the visualization wizards that Cardo DBA has built into it, and then see what code is produced, right? So you can go to these wizards. If I click Coropleth, it updates how my markers are rendered. And I can go to the Cardo CSS and see exactly how they're doing that. And it's based on this previous lesson. I, I hope that it's clear to you how this works. But this is a nice way to, um, to get part of the way there with Cardo DB. And then you can tweak it to make it exactly what you want it to be. So if you if you mostly like this, but you don't like the cutoff of 7.5, you actually want it to be 7 and 3 quarters, you can just do that here um, without doing it through their UI, because there's no way to edit exactly that. OK? So I hope that that's clear. And it's I think it's a really good way to learn, too, not just to get part of the way there, but to see like, oh wait, how would how would you do bubbles? And then you can look at the Cardo CSS and you can see, well, they're doing something pretty similar to what what you would what they were doing for the categories of the Coropleth rather. Um, or you could look at the intensity and go to the Cardo CSS and um, try to figure out which part changed to make it make the effect that it's making now. Okay? Another thing you can do, one of the great benefits of Cardo CSS being a language the way it is, is that others pe other people's code, other people's Cardo CSS is online. For instance, I didn't totally mean to click on that, but I did. Uh, the Humanitarian OpenStreetMap team has a humanitarian, um, they have their own style sheets, and they're all here online. And you can <clears throat> you can click here and see an example of what this the end result of the style is. And you can actually look through their code. Cardo CSS files are going to end in .mss. 
All right. So you can click on one of these .mss files, and you can see code that hopefully by now makes a lot more sense to you than it did before. Okay, let me get back to my slides. Uh, finally, just don't don't be afraid to experiment. Especially in CarterDB, you're not going to break anything by changing the Carter CSS. The worst case scenario is um, your features don't show up the way you expect them to. You can click the visualization wizard and reset those styles and go back to experimenting. And this is one line from the documentation that I think is amusing. It's for the line, line smooth property. Um, if you include a value greater than one, it's going to produce wild looping geometries. Um, and I think that's one of the exciting things about Carter CSS is that it is a language, so it's more open-ended and you're not restricted by a UI and you can try things that maybe do things that were totally unexpected by the people that created these tools. So I hope that gives you a good introduction to Carter CSS. I hope you feel more confident with it and will be able to give it a shot in CardoDB for this week. Bye.